Thank you for joining us tonight for Striving for Cognitive Wellness. This webinar series is brought to you by Can Do Multiple Sclerosis, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada. My name is Laura Allen, Programs Manager for Can Do MS, and I will be your moderator this evening. Can Do MS delivers health and wellness education programs to help families with MS thrive. Please visit the Can Do MS website kendu-ms.org to learn more about Kendu MS's online and nationwide in-person programs. The mission of the National MS Society is to help people affected by MS live their best lives as they stop MS in its tracks, restore what has been lost, and end MS forever. You can explore other societies' programs, services, resources, and connection opportunities at nationalmssociety.org. We will, have, we will save about 20 minutes at the end of this webinar for questions and answers. If you have a question during the presentation, you can type it in using the Q&A pod found on the bottom right of your screen. I encourage you all to be part of this interactive discussion. This presentation is being recorded and will be archived on the Can Do MS website. You can download a copy of tonight's presentation and our library article from the Files pod. You will also be able to access these resources in the follow-up email that will be sent out by the end of the day tomorrow. First speakers this evening are Roz Kalb and Janet DeClark. Megan Beyer was not able to join us this evening. Roz Kalb is a clinical psychologist who has specialized in MS care, support, and education for over 30 years. Roz was with the National MS Society from 2000 to 2016. She is currently working with the Society as a consultant, and she is also a senior programs consultant on the Can Do MS team. Good evening, Roz. Hi, Laura. Glad to be here. And then we have Janet Clark. She is a speech language pathologist with over 30 years of experience working with individuals with multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, brain injury, and stroke in acute and post-acute inpatient rehab, skilled nursing, outpatient, and home health settings. Janet is currently working in an acute inpatient rehab at Dignity Health Marin Medical Center in Santa Maria, California. Good evening, Janet. Good evening, Laura. Happy to be here as well. Hello, Roz. Hello. And now I'm going to turn the meeting over to Roz. Thanks, Laura. And for those of you who are paying attention to the numbers, Janet and I have known each other for a very long time. And together we've been working in MS for a really long time. A really long time. <laughs> so tonight, tonight we want to explain um, the most uh, common cognitive changes that occur in MS. We're going to describe what those changes that are that happens so commonly in MS. And, and we're going to talk about how those changes impact very important aspects of your life, your relationships, employment, and your communication with important people in your life. And lastly, um, and probably most importantly, we're going to explore and provide very practical strategies to help you improve mood, which has an impact on cognition, and your everyday cognitive function. So we're really looking forward to doing this. Now, before we move ahead, I just want to call attention to the, the, the two polls that are in the lobby that you can see. And as is often the case, the vast majority of you tonight are people living with MS. Um, so you have a, some homework to do after tonight's webinar because everything that you're going to learn about the cognitive challenges that many of you are experiencing, in fact, almost 70% of you say that you've experienced cognitive challenges in the past year, your homework is to take this information from tonight's webinar and share it with the important people in your life, your support partner, your extended family, and anybody else in your world that you feel needs to have a better understanding of um, the cognitive changes you're having. And I just want to call out really quickly that 20% of you, 21% of you aren't sure whether you're experiencing cognitive changes or not. And 
if you're not sure, this is a wonderful time to go to your healthcare team and ask for a cognitive screen. Um, they will be able to refer you to somebody who can do a screening. And the National MS Society now strongly recommends that everybody get a cognitive screening at the time of diagnosis and then every year thereafter. So particularly for those of you out there who aren't sure, um, this is a good time to talk to your team about a screen. So we're talking about cognition tonight, but I think it's important to think a bit about what it is, because it's very central to who we are. It's all of our higher level brain functions, the things that make us very distinctly human and that help us manage all the key aspects of our life and how we feel about things. So cognition encompasses all of that. More specifically, it's how we understand and use language, how we communicate, how we understand each other, put our thoughts into words and convey them to other people. It's how we pay attention to the things that we're doing, um, the functions that allow us to multitask as busy homemakers or busy employees in an office or just in everyday life. And it controls whether we can stay focused without getting distracted um, or whether we can shift attention um, quickly when we need to shift attention. It's about how we learn and then remember new information. So everything that we learn every day of our lives gets encoded in our brains and MS can affect how that learning and remembering happens. It's how we plan and perform complex tasks. So we, we plan a series of steps to accomplish a goal and our cognition is what helps us outline the task and then implement those steps in the appropriate order. It also helps us solve problems, um, problems of everyday life or problems like a math problem. Any kind of problem where we have to come up with a solution, our cognition is what helps us do that, and it also helps us monitor our behavior, how we behave and what choices we make in everyday life. So it's, it's pretty important, and again, it's what makes us Human, And I think one other thing I want to add here is cognition is about how we process incoming information. So we're getting stimuli all the time through all of our five senses, and our brain is processing that information and figuring out what to do with it. It's like a massive computer. And that is probably the cardinal change that happens in MS, that that processing speed uh, can be slowed down, which then affects all of these other functions. So how do these cognitive changes relate to other characteristics of the disease? Well, we have to start by saying that at least 65% of people with MS are going to experience a change in cognition. That's a remarkably high number. It makes it one of the most common um, symptoms of multiple sclerosis. So it's not surprising that so many of you um, report that you've experienced some changes in the past year. Now, one of the interesting things about cognition is it's very central to who we are and it plays a very important part in our lives, but all kinds of other factors impact our cognition, not just whether um, we have lesions in certain areas of the brain or a certain amount of brain atrophy or, or tissue loss that contributes to it. We have other factors that are more within our control that impact cognition. So as you can see here, um, our diet and exercise or our healthy behaviors can impact our cognition. Um, our good MS care and our overall health care can affect cognition. So can the quality of our sleep. And we know that sleep is often impacted uh, in people with MS for a variety of reasons. And how socially interactive we are, the more stimulating 
interactions we have with our environment, the more of an impact that has um, on cognition. And then there's mood and anxiety. And we're really going to focus quite a bit tonight on the ways in which our moods and anxiety levels can impact uh, cognition. Now, before we dive into that, again, I want to emphasize that Cognitive changes can occur at any point in the disease, even as the, as the, as the very first symptom of the disease. The most uh, cognitively impaired uh, person I ever worked with in my practice um, was only 15 years old, and uh, she had no physical symptoms. It took them a long time to figure out that this was even MS that was, that was going on. So it can occur at any point. And you can be very, very severely disabled physically and have no cognitive impairment, but conversely, um, like this young lady, uh, you can have very significant cognitive issues but appear physically unimpaired. Um, so it's unrelated to disability level, which means that nobody can tell by looking at you whether you're experiencing uh, cognitive impairment or not. Um, even your neurologist. Um, but we do know that these changes occur more often in those with progressive disease. The, uh, uh, it does not correlate uh, with many other disease characteristics, but we do know that the most significant predictor of cognitive loss is the, the brain tissue loss or atrophy that can happen in MS over time. Why do we care about all of this? Why do Janet and I feel so passionately about people um, getting screened for cognitive impairment, getting the help that they need? Well, cognitive changes really impact um, our feelings about ourselves, right? Our, the way we think and the, what we feel are very central to our personalities, to our own humanity. And so when our cognition isn't working right, our self-esteem suffers. Um, we lose our self-confidence. Um, and we just don't feel like ourselves. Also, cognitive changes are one of the most common reasons why people leave the workforce early. So we want to identify these problems early to help people stay employed as long as they want to and are able. Um, they impact our ability to manage a busy household. Uh, you know, moms and dads are multitaskers all the time. That's what life is these days. And when you can't multitask as well, that's a problem. Cognitive changes also impact relationships uh, because of role changes that sometimes occur um, around MS when somebody can no longer do some of the tasks that they used to do or people have difficulty remembering conversations or communicating effectively, all of that can lead to a strain um, in relationships with partners, spouses, close family members, friends, colleagues at work. And communication, as I've said, when you're having trouble remembering things or organizing your thoughts or figuring out um, what you want to say, communication can feel stilted or uh, problematic. And if your processing is slow so that you can't keep up with what the other person is saying very easily, you can feel out of sync with the person you're trying to have a conversation with. Um, and that is very, very disruptive in everyday life. So clearly, these cognitive changes have a huge impact on, on daily life. So now I want to zero in a little bit more on the feelings that can have an impact. So think about this. How many of you um, have found it difficult to think clearly after the death of a loved one or when you're in a period of grieving? It's hard to organize our thoughts and get them together because we're so overwhelmed by that feeling of grief and loss. And how many of you couldn't think of something simple, like a word or, or a simple math or somebody's name, when you were put on the spot? You had to come up with it right away. You were in a stressful situation, like 
meeting your boss's wife and the everything you couldn't think of her name and you're supposed to think of her name and it happens to me all the time so so I can really relate to that but when <laughs> me too. You're anxious, when you're anxious your ability to think and and come up with words and problem solve is really impaired so let's go back to our circle and you can see why we're really focusing uh, tonight on mood and anxiety um, because both of these can really uh, interfere with your cognition day to day. So let's hear from somebody um, who has MS. Susan, the 45-year-old woman was relapsing with relapsing remitting MS and she says, I used to write, be creative. I picked up on everyone else's mistakes at work. Now I have no brain, no creative thoughts. I'm not the person I used to be. When people talk to me, I don't always get it. I need them to repeat things. I wish you knew the person I used to be. When I first read this, um, I'm not the person I used to be, it really, it really struck me as, as one of the most painful, painful parts of living with a chronic illness that takes things away from you. We've heard people say this about some physical symptoms, certainly about cognitive changes. They just don't feel like the same person. And conversely, sometimes support partners, family members, or friends will say, this doesn't feel like the same person. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm communicating with the same, same person or interacting with the same person because they're behaving differently in conversations or they're behaving differently in everyday activities. So this is a very, very um, important aspect of the experience. And I hope some of you um, listening tonight who have MS will, will share feelings if you have that kind of feeling with some of the people around you. Similarly, depression can have a significant impact on cognition. Um, now, like cognition, depression is a very, very common symptom of MS. Notice I say a symptom of MS. It's not just something that you experience in reaction to having a chronic illness. It's part of the disease process itself. So it, too, can happen as a first symptom of MS. And it's more common in MS than in other chronic illnesses or in the general population. Um, and we know that depression can cause or worsen cognitive changes. So when somebody comes to me or to Janet or to a neurologist and says, you know, I think I'm having problems with my cognition, one of the first things every one of us would recommend is the screening for depression. Because if you're depressed, mm -hmm. we want to take care of that first, right off the bat. Absolutely. Because some of those cognitive changes might actually uh, start to, to lessen just because you've taken care of the depression that's making them worse. So early screening for depression, again, this is something we recommend that everybody at the time of diagnosis and at least yearly thereafter um, should have a, a depression screen. And I just want to point out a resource for you, and we can uh, send you more information about it afterwards. But Mental Health America is an organization that you can access online, and they offer totally free and confidential screening for a variety of uh, mental health problems, including depression, anxiety, and other things. Um, it's it's all done with good validated measures, and you get a printout uh, that tells you whether you're actually experiencing a significant depression or significant anxiety. And then you can take that printout to your healthcare provider and say, I need help with this. So uh, make sure that you're paying attention to your mood. And if you are, in fact, depressed, there are some good things that you can do about it. 
So we all know that there are medications to treat depression, and we are fortunate these days that there are many to choose from that work differently um, so that people can work with a, a mental health provider to find the treatment that offers them adequate benefit um, with a minimum of side effects. Um, and many of them are now approved to treat both depression and anxiety, which we'll talk about in a minute. So medications are definitely a valuable option. Along with that, I have a prejudice here, but I strongly believe that medication by itself um, is only taking care of part of the problem. When you work with a psychologist or a, or a psychotherapist um, with some sort of treatment, usually cognitive behavior therapy, that's the one that's been tested the most and compared with antidepressant medication, uh, but also other types of therapies, you're actually talking about the issues that are most challenging in your life. So you're dealing with the chemical issues of the medication, but the talk therapy really um, is what helps you to delve into um, the challenges of your everyday life, and they work really well together. I would also strongly encourage you to add exercise because we've learned it can do a mess. Um, the physical exercise that's geared to your abilities and your limitations um, can enhance your mood. So I, I see it as a three-legged stool, um, adding um, exercise to medications and talk therapy. There are also some important at-home strategies that you can use on your own. Um, one important one is to give yourself time to grieve. Um, MS causes a lot of losses and changes in people's lives, and it's important to grieve over those changes because grieving is the very first step um, to problem solving and coping and adaptation. Um, so that grieving process is healthy and it's important. Um, and so it's been recommended, as some people call it, the 20-minute the, the, the pity party, but whatever you want to call it, um, give yourself time in a day to be sad, to, to grieve over things that are different or, or lost for you, um, and then put it aside and say when those intrusive thoughts come in about the grieving, well, I'll have another chance tomorrow. But you give yourself that 20 minutes a day. And if the thoughts come up, you can also uh, spend you know, a couple of minutes on it and then put it aside until tomorrow. You can track your thoughts about cognition or any other aspects of your life that you feel have been changed significantly by MS. You can keep a diary. You can journal about it in ways that might be helpful to you. You can talk to yourself like you would to a friend. What advice would you give to a friend who is telling you about these feelings or these challenges? and be your own best advisor. And don't forget to remind yourself of your three top strengths every day. Also, three successes you've had. The more you can remind yourself of those positives, the better you feel about yourself. And practicing gratitude works very well for many people to relieve feelings of depression. Um, some people spend five minutes a day writing down things that they are grateful for, or each night before they go to sleep, they come up with three things that they were grateful for that day. Uh, some people do it around the dinner table. But all of those things that come from the, the study of positive psychology help us manage feelings of sadness and depression. So, Dave is a 60-year-old man who has secondary progressive MS, and he also says something very, very powerful. I don't enjoy parties or social gatherings anymore. I get anxious. I worry I won't be able to get my point across, that people will notice I can't get my words out. I worry that I'm not only isolating myself, but also my wife. So here's a gentleman who's experiencing cognitive changes that really affect his self-confidence, his self-esteem, his self-image, so he doesn't want to be around other people. 
There may be some depression playing into this as well, but what's lovely about what he's saying is that he recognizes that he's isolating himself, but also probably isolating his wife if he doesn't want to go out and be with people and do things. And she's probably finding that very difficult. So let's talk about what's going on with Dave. He's got some cognitive issues for sure, but he also is dealing with anxiety, social anxiety about what will happen to him in a social setting. If we can move to the next slide. So like depression, anxiety is very common in MS. Anxiety disorders, which refer to um, pretty significant um, anxiety, the kind that has you ruminating and going over and over thoughts in your mind that worry you and keep you awake at night and interfere with your productivity. That, that's significant anxiety, and that's three times greater in MS than in the general population. So it is very common. And when you're very anxious, that can worsen cognitive dysfunction, specifically that processing speed I'm talking about. I was talking about where you just can't process incoming information as quickly as you could. You can't organize or process your thoughts quickly. Well, if you're tied up in knots of anxiety, it's not hard to imagine why those little neurons can't fire off and send messages quickly because you're all tied up in knots with anxiety. Your brain is. So what we know about this is that when your heart rate is elevated and when we're anxious, you know, the, our heart pounds and our heart rate goes up. And when it goes up above 100 beats per minute, that affects the functioning of your prefrontal cortex, the front part of your brain, and that's where we do our problem solving. So when the prefrontal cortex can't function right, we suddenly find ourselves stuck. We can't solve problems. We can't think through the steps, um, and that's the result of anxiety. So it's really important that we come up with some strategies for managing that anxiety. So again, um, my bias, uh, psychology, psychologists, other mental health professionals can be extremely helpful here. Cognitive behavioral therapy where you talk and think about your usual responses to things, your problem solving strategies, and you look at how you might want to alter your thinking about situations in ways that make them less anxiety provoking. Um, that's one type of therapy. And then exposure therapy where you gradually expose yourself in the therapeutic setting to things that make you anxious and you talk about uh, why they make you anxious and you gradually build up more tolerance for them. Um, so those are proven, very effective therapies for reducing anxiety. Um, but there are also important self-care options. And exercise is a, is a prime example. Getting out and moving um, and stretching and doing things like yoga and Pilates, all of those can help calm you down. Um, and I, I think it's important to add here that I said before that some of the very excellent medications available for depression also treat anxiety. And I, I wouldn't want any of you to deny yourself the benefits if you need medication to help you manage um, anxiety. It is fine. It can be done in conjunction with these other talk therapies and also self-care. So we've got a lot of options for treating anxiety. And we have some at-home strategies. So again, finding a peaceful space, taking a 20-minute break. You might find deep breathing and relaxation exercises to be very beneficial. You might find mindfulness or meditation to be helpful. Those are skills that can be learned um, with practice. 
They're not easy. They're not a slam dunk to learn how to meditate or even to learn how to relax. But a mental health professional can teach you those skills. And you can monitor your thoughts and just pass them on. Let those thoughts pass through. You acknowledge that you have them, and then you put them aside. You put them behind you while you meditate on something peaceful, whether it's something you're listening to or a beautiful picture that you're looking at or scenery. And again, these are skills that you can learn. So now I want to ask you all a polling question. Which of these anxiety strategies do you want to try after this webinar? And just indicate all that apply. Everybody's, no, people are answering. Changing in front of my eyes, but it seems it like is. deep breathing and relaxation are kind of uh, leading the pack along with taking a break and mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Whichever of these you try or all of them, be patient with yourself and remember that any skill takes time. When you're having trouble thinking of the right word at the right time, which strategy would you find most helpful? Am I asking that at the wrong time? Yes. No, that's okay. Because um, this is kind of a nice segue into what I'm going to be talking about. Absolutely. So, Janet, take it away and tell people what they can do. And okay. Sorry, that's on your polling question. You did not. Absolutely, you did not, Roz. And thank you so much for really driving home how mood and cognition interact. Um, and also the importance of exercise in addressing mood because that's also one of the best things you can do for your cognition as well. Um, exercise, Pilates, yoga, anything that you are able to do can have um, a beneficial effect on your thinking and on your cognition as well. So one thing that Roz had brought up was that anxiety can have a big effect on your processing speed. So let's start out with thinking of the cognitive domain of attention and processing. And this is the ability to take in information and um, follow it. So this, your speed of processing can be affected, meaning that you feel like you can't keep up with what somebody is saying or with a lecture that is being presented. You feel like you're just a step behind. Um, also, capacity can be affected. That's the TMI, too much information. Your brain's had enough, and it shuts off. Um, you may also find that you're often able to do things that you did previously. You just can't do them as quickly. Uh, you may feel that if you just had a little bit more time, you'd be able to get it done. You'd be able to, to take in that information and really process it all and understand it. Okay, so you, these are some of the things that you may be feeling. These are just some examples. Again, usually people say, I feel like I'm a day late and a dollar short. I just can't keep up. Uh, you're overwhelmed if information comes in too fast or from too many directions. So if, some, if you're talking to one person in a single conversation, that may be fine. If you're talking to three people and there are four people as part of the conversation, that may be uh, different altogether. Um, much like the scenario that Roz brought up, you might feel that you understand something too late, your response is too late, and by the time you think of how you want to respond to something, the conversation has already moved on. Um, trouble keeping up and responding quickly. The one thing I hear all the time is people have trouble with time constraints and that's getting back to the anxiety that Roz talked to us about. One thing time constraints do is they add some pressure and when we feel extra pressure we may feel anxiety and then we may be even less likely to be successful in attending and processing. 
And of course, I hear this from everybody, I can't multitask anymore. So we're going to be talking about these things a little bit. I, you may want to know, so what do I do about this? This is how I feel. So here are a few strategies. Again, these are just a few ideas. You may have some of your own as well. I'm just trying to get you to, to think of along these lines. Um, first thing you can do is try to modify your environment to make it easier for you to attend to something. Um, a quiet room is very helpful. Uh, as an example, I was in my office yesterday, our rehab office at the hospital, and there were two other people I was talking to, but then there was another conversation going on to the left of me, and there was so much noise and too many conversations, and I couldn't process what was happening. So I moved the people I was talking to to the other side of the room where it was quieter. You can ask the speaker to slow down. Some people speak very fast. Some people don't speak as fast, but that's okay to ask somebody to slow down. Change a task that is um, simultaneous, which is multitasking, to something sequential or alternating. So that means if you're trying to cook dinner and talk on the phone and help kids with homework, you want to, instead of doing all three of those things at once, you might want to turn off the stove, finish your phone conversation, and then get back to what you were cooking. But don't do those things at the same time. And when I say that multitasking is overrated, there are actually studies that show that, that we, were, we are trying to do multiple things at the same time. We do none of them very well. So I think that's a lesson for all of us to learn that uh, while we prize that in our society, it's probably not the best thing to do in those situations where we can change it. Another processing strategy you can use, and this is a conversational strategy, is um, what I call repeat and verify. This could be um, things like if somebody tells you, well, we're going to go to dinner at six o'clock next Wednesday, you just repeat it back saying, oh, okay, so we're going to dinner on Wednesday at six o'clock, right? And that person says, yes. If you say, oh, so we're going Tuesday at six o'clock, that person can say, no, no, it's Wednesday at six o'clock. So that gives you a couple of options. It buys you some time. It allows you to hear what that person said again, because you're repeating it. And you can also verify that what you heard is correct. And this is something that a lot of people do naturally. So it's not something where you're all of a sudden going to have a neon sign saying, I have MS and I'm having trouble following this. People do this quite naturally. And in a conversation, it's a great tool because it lets uh, the person you're talking to know that you're listening to them. This is especially important as well when you're in a doctor's office with important information that you need to process. And we'll also get into the importance of writing things down. But if someone is giving you some directions, um, giving you test results, anything that you deem important, you want to make sure that you heard it, you heard it right, and you can control that conversation before moving on to the next topic. Okay, you can move ahead, there we go. Um, the other thing, and I think a lot of us use these now, they've become so ubiquitous, email, text messages, um, our phones. While we usually talk about how bad tech is in our lives, the nice thing about email and texts and everything else is that they provide written records of conversations you can keep them. If you feel that you forgot something or that you didn't process it, and you can say, could you send that to me in a text? Could you email me that information? And then you have a written record of what your conversation was that you can refer back to again and again. And as I brought up previously, um, you can write down while listening to make it a more active process. Sometimes mixing your modalities of just listening, but then doing something at the same time, writing what you're listening to helps you to process it a little bit more and to understand it more. 
And as you can see in this little cartoon here, um, I occasionally need to read my tweets to remember what I was doing. Well, I'm not sure Twitter is the best thing. I don't know much about Twitter, so I can't really say. But reading what you've written before, reading previous text messages and emails can be a great tool to remember what you were doing. So let's move on to some other strategies. Um, one of the scenarios Roz had brought up had to do with a man who felt like he couldn't think of the right words at the right time. And this is a common complaint I hear, especially as a speech pathologist. So one of the things that's important to understand with uh, word retrieval with MS, thinking of words with MS, is that these functions are more likely associated with that slow processing I just talked about and slow processing speed, as well as getting distracted um, and retrieve, trouble retrieving the word from where it is stored. What I'm trying to reiterate is that you haven't lost the word, it's there. It's just taking you longer to get it out of your head. You have not forgotten the word. It's just a problem bringing it up at the right time. Confrontation naming is rarely affected. What that means is if somebody shows you a picture of a dog or a lion, you know what it is and you can name it. And true aphasia is very rare in MS. Aphasia is a language disorder that usually results from um, a stroke in the language center of the brain. And you know, language issues with MS tend to be more, uh, tend to be higher level and tend to be, occur more in conversation. So you may feel that the word is right on the tip of your tongue and doing what I do and I've done it for 38 years, I get that feeling as well. So all of us have experienced that. You may feel that you're experiencing it a little bit more than you used to. So, um, and then what happens when you can't think of that word is you get frustrated. And the more frustrated you get, the more anxious you get, then you're even less likely when you're anxious to be able to think of the word because it does affect your ability to bring it out. And then you may withdraw from conversations. You may also find that you're tripping up on more specific words. And I use an example here. Um, you may not have trouble thinking of the word dog. You may have trouble thinking of the word basset hound, the breed of the dog, something much more specific. And in this example here, um, you're more likely to have trouble retrieving the word locomotive versus the word train. So more general terms usually come more easily. It's the specific ones that are really meaningful that you feel like are just the right thing to say that you have more trouble with. And you may also find yourself talking around a word. And the term for that is a great word called circumlocution. And what that is, is um, saying, oh, you know that thing, that thing that runs on the tracks and it has a lot of cars on it. That's circumlocution. You are talking around the word. You can't think of the word train or can't think of the word locomotive so you're describing it, you're talking around it. And that's actually not a bad thing to do. Okay, go ahead. And as you can see, um, you know, way back in pre the prehistoric era, uh, dinosaurs have some issues with this. So uh, despite its name, the thesaurus was quite often at a loss <laughs> for words. <laughs> okay. So what do you do about that? Again, this is just a sampling of strategies, but these are some of the ones um, that I use in therapy with patients. Some people use gesture a lot, and they can pantomime the word, or sometimes just moving your hand or doing something else that's a, a motor movement can help you to cue the word. Um, but it, if it doesn't, sometimes it helps you to communicate the idea without words. And the whole point of it is to not always come up with the right word at the right time. You just want to keep your, your lines of communication open, keep a conversation going. 
The other thing you can do is you can write or draw it on your hand with a pen, pencil, your finger. Find a synonym or an antonym. Oh, you know, it, it, it's not that thing that you drink in the morning that, um, you know, it's not this. It's not coffee. It's something else. Um, talking around the word. As I said before, circumlocution is a really good thing to do. It's a great strategy. Describe the attributes. It's red. It's round. It bounces. Um, you know, that would be a, a ball. Anything that you can use to either cue yourself or at least let your listener know what it is you're talking about. Um, sometimes thinking of the first letter of the word helps. It starts with an S or I know it has an X in it somewhere. And the other strategy is to think of the category the word belongs to. Oh, it's one of those things that lives in Africa and runs on the savanna. It's an African animal. It's an animal. And again, you don't want to get too hung up on finding the right word if you can. Lots of times these strategies can help you to do that, but at the same time, the whole point is to keep the conversation going. And very often your listener will say, oh, yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about, and you move on. And that is success. Okay. Keep. Okay. So oh, here we have this again. So when you are having <laughs> trouble thinking of the right word at the right time, which strategy would you find most useful? Using a gesture or a pantomime? Writing or drawing, finding a synonym or using an antonym, talking around the word, such as describing its attributes, its function, using the first letter of the word, or thinking of the category that the word belongs to. What might you find most helpful? And you, you may not have anything at this point. And it looks like a lot of people... Yes. Talking around the word, describing attributes. Yes. Excellent. Um, that's probably the easiest thing to do, and I think all of us do that from time to time. So, But it's good to know that um, a lot of you are actually using circumlocution, and that's a word you can remember. Circumlocution. Okay, let's move on now. Let's talk about memory, and we're not going to get into the details of different types of memories, um, different, because we do break it down into working memory, perspective memory, and all that. Those are not things you really need to, to know. Um, I just want to talk about it in a very broad sense. In MS, it was previously thought to be trouble with retrieving stored memories, that you had all these memories in your head and you had trouble pulling them out. But actually, um, it's now been found that the trouble lies with learning or acquiring new information. And again, that ties back into processing speed, trouble with capacity, difficulty with attention. Um, sometimes the problem is with attention and processing speed and capacity rather than memory. So, and usually that's something that you don't really have to know, but someone like Roz or someone like myself, when we're sitting with somebody, that's one of the things I usually try to tease out. So these may be some of the things you may feel if you're having memory problems. Um, you have trouble learning or recalling new information. You may have trouble recalling what we're doing tonight. So um, you misplace things. You forget conversations or dialogue. You've had a conversation at breakfast about something um, with a spouse or with a child, and then when it's brought up later in the day, you have no recollection of it. You forget appointments. That's something that's, that's pretty common as well. And the classic walking into a room and forgetting why you're there. So here are a few strategies. Um, this is, these are some of the things you can do just telling yourself to do them. You can combine all your modalities. You can see something, then you can say it, hear it, write it, do it. If you're listening to a lecture 
and you're trying to remember a fact, you see it up on the screen, then you say it to yourself. That's another modality. Then you're hearing yourself saying it again. Then you're writing it down and then you practice it. Using all of those things, combining your senses actually helps you to recall something later. The other thing you may want to do is um, when somebody is telling you something that you really want to learn, say, could you show me this? Let me show you how I do it. Is it right? This is how I interpret this. Let me practice this. Please write it down. And that gets back to those processing strategies as well. You, you want to repeat things. You want to make sure they're correct. You want to write them down. So the biggest thing um, I can say is attention and slow processing play a huge role in memory. You absolutely cannot remember what you couldn't pay attention to or process in the first place. So if you find yourself very anxious, stressed, and I think we've all felt this way from time to time. And um, someone is telling you something, you're supposed to be listening to something, and you just can't process it because you're too anxious or you're too stressed out or you're too fatigued, you're not going to remember it because you couldn't actually get it into your brain to be stored. Um, these are a few more strategies again, asking people to slow down, say it again, do one thing at a time that's getting back to the attention issue, using a quieter place. And I know a lot of you already said that taking a short break is very effective, and that really is a, a good strategy. Just know that when it comes to memory and to cognition in general, small little changes can yield very big benefits. So functional memory can often be improved with better organization strategies. So let's start talking about some of organization and executive functioning because our executive functioning occurs in that prefrontal cortex and in the frontal lobe of the brain. And it is responsible for planning and prioritizing, um, organizing and managing time, getting started on projects, initiating activities, as well as self-monitoring ourselves modifying our behavior in response to changing situations, and also maintaining a topic. So if you're having difficulty in the area of executive functioning, you may have trouble with any one of these things. If you start to look at strategies to improve that, that's actually going to improve your cognition overall. So let's go to the next slide. You may feel overwhelmed. Uh, by large worker home projects. And I'm sure many of you feel that way. I've heard that a lot. Missing deadlines is common. Getting lost when trying to tell a story, especially if you get distracted and then you can't remember where you were or then you start to meander and you can't remember what the point was. Or finding yourself blurting out or saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. What do you do if you're feeling that way? So let's take a look at some of the strategies that may help. First of all, when it comes to organization, um, consolidate and centralize your organization strategies. Many of us now use our phones and our computers, but if you're living in a home with more than just you, I still recommend that you designate one place in your house as the big grand central station of information for everybody that lives in that house. And usually the best way to do that is get a nice big calendar um, up on a refrigerator or in an area of the house where everybody can see it and everything that everybody is doing is going on to that calendar. That way you know what everybody is doing and it's all in one place. Make a place for mail, bills, phone messages, to-do lists. Um, you know, when you walk in the door, you put your keys somewhere, you put your wallet somewhere, your shopping list is somewhere, your mail goes somewhere. I recommend that you put all of those things in one place. Don't have a place for your keys, a place for your wallet. Have them all be different places. Put those all in one place, whether it's a basket, a bin, a little organizational thing that goes on the wall. 
Um, and the important thing is make sure that all the information that's on that main calendar for everybody in the house is also on a portable calendar. That could be, if you're still using pen and paper, a day planner. Um, most of us now use our cell phones. So whatever information that is on that calendar at the house goes into your calendar on your phone so it is with you on the go at all times or in your day planner at all times, something that you're carrying with you. So let's move on to the next one. Here are some examples. Um, just a few little pictures here, like putting calendars on the refrigerator, um, whatever you feel is best, make sure you leave a pen, um, something where everyone can write on it in a convenient place. And everything goes, look at that third picture right there in the top row, everything is going in one spot there, including some, you know, stamps and other little notes. Uh, there's a rack for keys. I like this middle picture on the bottom row. That is a single spot for just the organization of the house generally. And then I literally have something in my house that looks like the last picture there where keys and envelopes and mail go at the top of the stairs, walk in the door, boom, it all goes in that one spot. And I never have to think again, where did I put my phone? Where did I put my wallet? Where are my keys? I know where they are every time because they're always in the same place. And that really takes a lot of the pressure off your brain to try to keep it straight. You know where it is, always in the same place all the time. Okay, move along. So there's a, a really well-organized office there. Um, and then on the right is something that's called, I hated the term, it was called a mom's calendar. Um, this is a wall calendar that you can actually use for people's, everyone in the family's name at the top and then what everybody's appointments are and what their activities are throughout the week and throughout the month. I actually used one of these as I was raising my three kids and it worked like a charm. So just if you want a recommendation, I know they still make them. Uh, it's an easy way to keep track of what everyone in the family is doing, especially if you have children in the house and their practices and after school activities and all of those things. Okay. So here's what not to do. It's really easy. Sticky notes and post-its are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. And I'm not crazy about them unless I put one in the middle of my forehead. So these are the things not to do. Um, putting sticky notes everywhere. Look at this guy. I forgot where I put a sticky note I wrote on to remind me to get something I need to remember. That's pretty much how you remember something if you're putting a sticky note on the bathroom mirror, another one on um, the refrigerator, another one on the door into the garage. That's how your brain will organize itself, which is not organized at all. You want to keep everything very centralized and not put all of your reminders in a lot of different places. Okay? So one thing you want to remember is be very aware of fatigue. So when you're trying to attack a task and you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're very fatigued, um, you want to tackle the highest priority item first when you're less likely to be fatigued. And there is such a thing as physical fatigue and also cognitive fatigue. So there are times when our brains just don't really want to do anything else. And when you know you're feeling that way, trying to push through it is not a good idea. So you, you want to know when you're feeling your best and tackle the most important things first what, during those times when you feel your best. Um, schedule a time each day to attack large, overwhelming projects. Again, you want that to be during the times you're feeling your best. Um, another good idea, especially if you're having trouble with initiation and getting started, is to break something down. Put a time limit on it, like 15 minutes, and tell yourself, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to do this for five minutes, and then I'll stop. Or I'm going to do it for 15 minutes and then I'll stop. And usually when you get yourself started, you can find yourself going on a little bit longer once you get started. But then don't go until you're so worn out you can't continue. Make sure you build breaks into what you're doing. 
Also, make sure you limit visual and auditory distractions. You want to make sure the door is closed. If you're playing music, it's something soothing. Um, the other day, I was trying to work on something in my office, and I had the, the digital frame on my desk, and I kept looking at the pictures of my grandchildren when they were first born, and I became so obsessed with it, I got nothing done, so I had to unplug the frame. So I limited that visual distraction. <laughs> so, um, and again, don't try to push through that cognitive or physical fatigue. If you're feeling really worn out, whether cognitively and you can't think anymore, or physically, just take a break. Try to maintain consistency of energy. Don't get yourself to that point where you just can't do another thing. You want to stop before and take a break before you reach that point. Okay, so this is in response to usually a lot of the questions we get. We, we don't normally get them as often as we used to, but people have often asked about the brain training programs that are on the computer and the brain games, Lumosity and what, um, I can't remember the others off the top of my head. Um, so here's a little quote from some research. Um, there is little evidence that playing brain games in, improves underlying broad cognitive abilities or that it enables one to better navigate a complex realm of everyday life. And that was from a joint statement released by the Stanford Center for Longevity and the Max Planck Institute of Human Development in 2014. Um, the brain games you can play can make you very, very good at those specific tasks. The issue is, is those tasks and that mastery tends not to carry over to everyday life. Now, if you enjoy doing those, by all means do them. It's really important that you do things you enjoy. But if you are doing them because you feel it's going to strengthen your brain, there are some other things you can do instead of the computerized brain games. So when do you get help? When do you know that it is time that you really talk to your physician about getting some help for your cognition? Um, and so one is difficulty finding the right words, and that's if it's happening so much that you are having big issues with communication in your workplace or, um, and you, you can't do what you set out to do because you're finding it so difficult. Um, if you're having trouble remembering what to do on the job or during your daily routines at home, uh, if you're consistently showing poor judgment or, make, or making poor decisions, we all do that from time to time. But if you find that it's happening more often and you're hearing from people that, gee, why did you do that? Why did you say that? Why did you act that way? Um, you may want to seek help for that. And you have trouble keeping up with tasks or conversations. Again, you really want to look at how it's affecting your life and your daily function. So even if you find that these symptoms are mild, it can have a really big effect on your activities of daily living. So if that is happening and you find that you're just having trouble, more trouble getting through your day and you don't know what to do, Ask for help. Talk to your physician about seeing, a, you know, a psychologist, a speech pathologist, an occupational therapist, a neuropsychologist. Um, and again, I'll reiterate that people with multiple sclerosis leave the workforce because of cognitive and fatigue issues more than they do for mobility issues. And that also ties into a lot of what Roz discussed earlier about um, how you feel about yourself when these things happen and what you're telling yourself, and that be can become a vicious cycle and start to feed itself. It can make your cognition worse and less functional, and then you get more depressed and anxious because you're feeling your cognition is worse. So those are the times when you really want to seek help. Okay, and um, how, do you, how do you get help? Well, as I already said, speak to your physician. Normally, it is something um, you want to talk to your doctor about because your doctor would then make a referral for an evaluation and point you in the right direction. 
But instead of going to the doctor and saying, I'm having memory problems, because that's kind of vague, or I'm having trouble paying attention, you want to think of it in terms of function, exactly what is happening to you um, specifically. Are you forgetting conversations? Are you forgetting appointments? Are you forgetting words? So those are the things that you want to start keeping track of when you talk to your physician so it's easier to know what referrals to make. And also, depression has a significant effect on cognition, as does anxiety. And treating your mental health will improve your cognitive health as well. I can't say that enough. And that's why we combine these two things in this webinar. So there are Ron? some key takeaways from tonight. We'll do them very quickly so we can move on to questions. But just to remember, as we've both been saying, that mood and cognitive changes are very common, and you want to report them quickly to your healthcare providers, because when they're impaired, they impact your daily life and how you feel about yourself and how you function in your daily activities and in your relationships. And mood and cognitive symptoms are among the most difficult for support partners to understand. So it's very, very important to have open conversations about these symptoms um, so that you can understand each other and you can both get the help you need to deal with these changes. And please don't forget that depression is one of the most treatable symptoms of MS. Okay, and just remember that compensatory strategies with just a few of which I've introduced you to here this evening can improve function. But in order for those to work, you have to give yourself permission to do things differently than you did in the past. That's the key to success. It's hard to let go of how we used to do something, but if the way you used to approach something isn't working for you anymore, allow yourself to do something differently because there are a lot of ways to tackle an issue and tackle a problem, a lot of ways to get somewhere. Um, and remember that your support system and your health team, healthcare team can help. Um, there is no need to tackle these issues alone. So make sure you talk to your healthcare team about this. Well, thank you so much, Roz and Janet. That was uh, really fascinating or inform informative information. So before we um, start the Q&A, I do want to remind you that we will ask you to complete a survey that will pop up on your screen at the conclusion of the webinar. Roz, we did get a number of questions about brain atrophy. So can a, an MRI uncover brain atrophy? Absolutely. Um, it's one of the things that your doctor is looking for on MRI to see areas of the brain where brain tissue has been lost. Um, and it's something that you can ask your doctor about. What are you seeing on my scans um, in terms of brain atrophy? And is it progressing? And what are we doing to try to slow that down? So absolutely, it can be seen. And you should ask about it. And so I did get another question about measurement. So is, it, is, there, is there a specific way that it's measured? Um, yes, I think that the neurologist reading an MRI scan um, can make very specific assessments of uh, how much has occurred, how fast it's occurring. I don't know um, the technology of that, but it's now a very um, important uh, focus of research because they know that it can it begins very, very early in the disease process, and it does have a significant impact on cognition. So they're looking at it very closely. Great. So I did get some questions about um, dementia and Alzheimer's as it pertains to MS. So is cognitive dysfunction the same as dementia? I was diagnosed um, with the beginning dementia six months, and then six months later I was diagnosed with MS. So how, do, how does one know if they have dementia or if they're having cognitive issues? Okay. So dementia <laughs> is a global term. Dementia is a global term like fruit. 
right? Yeah, and thank you. you have an apple that would be getting Alzheimer's disease, or you could have a pear that's getting MS, or you could have a bunch of grapes, which is just getting old. So dementia just describes a, a, a loss or a significant loss of brain function, but it's used too casually, particularly in a situation like that. So we prefer to talk in terms of cognitive impairment as mm -hmm. opposed to the term dementia because it's a gradual process. It is completely different in MS than it is in mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease. They are two totally distinct diseases which affect the brain in different ways. So uh, the biggest difference is that in MS, you tend to have a problem in one particular area or another, or sometimes a few of the areas that Janet described, whereas in Alzheimer's, it's a global loss of cognitive function. That does not happen in MS, so they are mm -hmm. distinct. And, and if I can just bring up, because I don't think I said this, is that usually cognitive issues with MS range from mild to moderate. Um, that's t where most of them kind of are between the mild to moderate category. So, um, again, as Roz said, that's very different from what you're looking at with an Alzheimer's disease and that loss of global function. Roz, you had mentioned earlier that you can get screened for depression. So yeah. what is actually done to screen for depression? Well, it's done differently in different ways. But if you go to the, um, the National MS Society website, for example, and look up depression, there is a two-question screen um, that has been validated in MS that you can use on yourself, which basically asks you whether over the past two weeks you have felt down, depressed, or very, very sad most of the day every day. Or over the past few weeks, have you basically lost interest in things that used to be of interest to you? And a positive answer to one or both of those questions is a sign that you might well be depressed. And so you would talk to your doctor. I also mentioned um, Mental Health America, which has a website, and we will send out the link to you. But if you go to Mental Health America, um, and they offer these screenings, which you can take um, online um, and get a free confidential printout um, that you can share with your doctor. So that is another way um, to get screened. Okay? Absolutely. Um, Janet, we, we did have a lot of questions about leaving the workforce. And one of our participants was curious whether those leaving the workforce early are typically leaving by choice or due to involuntary termination. Uh, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Roz, would you know the answer to? I think that it's some of each. I think that some yeah. people think that they're simply not functioning, and it's too stressful, and they put all their energy into work, and they have nothing left when they get home, and so they choose to leave. But I think many people also find themselves in a situation where they're starting to get negative reviews. Uh, they're given performance plans, um, and if they don't, uh, in a timely way, ask for accommodations that would help them in the workplace or begin to use some tools and strategies to help them manage, they may find that they can't, uh, can't do the job and they are asked to leave. So that's why we, we want you to report problems very, very early. We want you to get evaluated. Mm -hmm and see somebody like Janet who says, what's your work and what's your work environment and what are mm -hmm. your tasks? And here are some tips and strategies that you can use in the workplace to compensate for the problems you're having. But we want you to do that before you get bad performance reviews. We want you to get that when you notice yourself that you're not performing the way you used to and before your manager notices. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. We want you to get help early. Mm -hmm. So we're just about out of time. I do have a question. Um, one of our participants wants to know how to spell, and I'm gonna, I might not pronounce this correctly, circum, 
Fill, fill me in here, Janet. Help me out. <laughs> Circumlocution. Circumlocution. Thank five you. five syllables. Okay. Wants to know how to spell it? Yes. Okay. C I R C U M L O C U T I O N. Yeah, I won the spelling bee. You did. Thank you. Thank you so much for that clarification. I very much appreciate it. I think that's the first time we've been asked how to spell something on a webinar. Go for it. I know. That was tough. Oh, my gosh. And, yeah, circumlocution, it's not always a bad thing. Well, thank you both so much for, for, for uh, some great information this evening. Roz, it was wonderful to have you uh, join us um, and at the last minute as uh, Megan wasn't able to join us this evening. So thank you, Roz. Sure. Pleasure. Thank and, you, Roz. <laughs> and thank you, Janet. It was wonderful um, hearing from you this evening as well. Thank you. Hope to see you both All right. soon. Yeah, hope, hope so. I do. Hope to see everyone soon, absolutely. So um, I would like to inform you um, of some additional resources that are informative and helpful that you can find on the ChemDoMS website. Um, you will find our webinars, e-news, library articles, and you can also submit a question to the Ask the Can Do team. In addition, I'd like to highlight some resources that are available from the National MS Society. They have brochures and video segments that can be accessed on the nationalmssociety.org. And you can also contact an MS Navigator at 1-800-344-4867. Hey, Laura, can I just yes? add one thing there? So when you call an MS Navigator, they have a special uh, employment team. So for those of you who have specific questions about employment um, or things that are problem on your job or what accommodations you might need, you can call a navigator and said, say, I would like to speak to somebody on the employment team about issues I'm having at work. Thank you for uh, giving us that little extra tidbit of information. I very much appreciate it. Um, and I would like to say, if you found this webinar to be valuable, I would ask you to please consider donating to Kendu MS or the National MS Society. Ah, MS Awareness Month is coming up. So during MS Awareness Month, we are excited to be working with other MS groups, including Biogen, and it will mark the fifth year of My Support Hero. So it's a way to celebrate all the support partners who stand by us. And I know Roz said that we'd like to get some more support partners on our webinars. So I'd encourage you to, A, invite your support partner to be on our next webinar, but I'd also uh, invite you to um, go to AboveMS.com and learn more about My Support Hero and access to helpful support resources. In addition, we have a campaign on our website called, excuse me, called Kick, Kick MS. It is a way to provide, um, it's a way to give back to, to Can Do MS, and it's a new peer-to-peer -peer fundraising platform. It's super easy to get started. You can find information on our website and then just uh, type in Kick MS to get started. In addition, we have a resource called MS Path to Care, which is an, initi an initiative to empower people affected by MS to be active partners in their healthcare experience. You can find information about that at mspathtocare.com. As always, we do have an upcoming webinar in our webinar series. That next webinar is Tuesday, April 14th. The topic is going to be fatigue and sleep. <laughs>